back to another episode of the podcast, jumping straight into Samsung is cheating when it comes to taking photos of the moon. So if you remember, Huawei did this as well, slightly different, but they did a similar thing where they would take a picture of the moon and overlay it on your picture. Samsung's doing it a little bit differently where it's not exactly overlaying an image, but it's adding craters and more texture to your moonshot, even if the data wasn't there to start. So the way people figured this out is it seemed originally like Samsung was doing it somewhat how you would expect them to. Then a Reddit user went out of his way and was testing it and put blurry photos of the moon on a monitor and then zoomed in on it and he would get a clear photo of the moon. So that raised some questions. But it looks like it does work slightly differently. And when I say that, I mean the way it's doing it isn't overlaying the image. It's keeping the color from the original image, even the shape of the moon, just adding detail. So it's doing some kind of AI trickery. There's actually on Samsung's site an entirely detailed out way that they're doing it. And I think this just raises some questions when it comes to AI in photography. I think that phones are gonna catch up, not because the quality is gonna be as good, but because they're gonna be switching out things in your original image or using AI to process it in a way, as Samsung's been doing here. So one of the ways they probably already do this is we've seen it done with people. They also do it for sure with food and the moon's just one other thing. But I think as this gets more and more advanced, we'll start seeing it in other technology and stuff, other, other photos and stuff like that. But that said, it's interesting just to see these companies are doing it more and more. And it seems like the iPhone is the only one that's probably not actually doing it at the moment. But who knows? I mean, none of these devices have been super tested out. Apple doesn't tote that they can take photos of the moon with their space zoom or anything like that. So it's hard to really say for sure. But what are some of the potential benefits and drawbacks of using AI to enhance our ability to capture images? The biggest thing that I can say right away is the drawback would be that you're not actually capturing what you think you're capturing. And if they're gonna go to their way to modify images like this, how do you know what you wanted to take the picture of is what you took the picture of? Or is it the real thing? It just draws a gray line. How do you know what's real and what's not real, even more so when it's something you use every day to take pictures or just use? I mean, it's, things are changing so quickly and they're changing even things that we're taking pictures of. It's just kind of wild. The technology is there. They're doing it. It's not hard. And it happens in real time. They just switch things out on you. And that said, talking about AI, which this is more of a language model, but GM is going to have Knight Rider in your next GM vehicle. So General Motors announced that they're developing a new assistant for its cars that will use AI. And it'll be pretty similar to ChatGPT, which is just a large language model. As I said, not quite AI. It feels like AI, but it's still just a large language model. And this is just... This will be interesting to be able to yell at your car to bring you places, to order you food, just do everything for you. I mean, you have the, you have Android Auto and stuff like that, but the assistant in cars has always kind of sucked. And this is just a step above what, you know, your phone might be able to do for you in your car and things like that. And it'd be interesting to just be able to walk up and adjust the temperature, place orders for food, like I said, even pull up things on map. I mean, stuff you do already, but you could just do with your voice. Wouldn't even have to think about double checking it. Just wild stuff happening in the world. So what do we do as AI becomes more prevalent in our lives? I think people are going to get lazy. Really think that's what's going to happen. People are going to start using this technology, get super lazy, and then the aliens take over and we all lose. So iPhone 15 dummy units have been spotted, and guess what? It looks like an iPhone. That's, that's about all I have to say on that topic. Apple AR is coming soon. Apparently, CEO Tim Cook is not having a great time with the development process of Apple's supposed headset that's coming soon. So he has, as it seems to be coming out, rushed the headset into being ready to be shipped. 
and that's with engineers telling him, uh-uh, it's not ready yet. We need to push this back even several years. Like, it's not there yet. It's going to hit delays, blah, 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 blah. We need to keep waiting. Now, what I think we're seeing happen here is I think Tim Cook has kind of laid steady for a while. Just repeat, do exactly what Apple's always done. Not a ton of innovation or new products, anything like that. It's all been pretty you know, kind of dialed in, follow everyone else, do it way better, do it the Apple way. I think what he's trying to do with this product, and I think we're going to see it, Apple for the first time in a long time really flop a product. I mean, Air Power was a flop too, but that never came out. So that's just a different thing altogether. Also, you could say rushed. So what I think we're going to see here is Steve Jobs, every once in a while, would have a massive product release you know, did the iPhone, did Mac, did, and it, it changed things. It wasn't like a, hey, everyone else has tried this for a while, we're releasing something. I think that's what Apple's trying to do here. I think Steve, or Tim Cook's just trying to rush it to the point of like being the leader, but also doing it the Apple way. I think we're gonna see something flop. If this actually comes out this year, might be the first time we see an Apple fail in a while with a real, technology that they actually have made, which would be different than air power as well. Yeah, one of the questions just we have here is just, you know, what is the balance of innovation and being a technology leader? And for, for Apple, I would say more and more they're moving towards the, yeah, we're an innovator, but we're like the second or third stage. Like we just do it right and call it. I think we're gonna see Again, we're going to see something wild happen hopefully this year. On top of that, Elon Musk has built a city called Snailbrook in Texas. It's in Bastrop County, which is just southeast of Austin. And it seems to be that this is a living accommodation that will be available for Tesla, SpaceX, Boring Company employees. And if that's true, I would assume he would have a pretty self-sustaining city, putting solar panels up. And I mean, we could see a really futuristic city built kind of in the middle of nowhere for the most part. Now, Elon hasn't actually said anything about this. It's all based off of land deeds that are being bought by his company. Also, the roads down there have Boring Boulevard, Water Jet Way, Cutterhead Crossing, just some things that kind of seem related to him. Signs even hang from the poles in the area with Welcome to Snailbrook, Texas, established in 2021. Again, Elon has not confirmed this happening, but journalists have not been able to quite nail down the amount of land he le has there, but it's at least 3,500 acres with the current reports, and some even estimate up to 6,000, which is actually a pretty massive town. I was reading somewhere between 100 and 110 houses, somewhere in there is about what he's hoping to build in this area. And the goal of this is to lower rent or lower being able to get a property here so it's below average at least and make it easier for Tesla, SpaceX, Boring Company to have employees living nearby and hopefully draw in people to work at these companies too. So apparently the Boring Company had already had some people be able to apply for homes like this and it was starting rent around 800 bucks a month for a two or three bedroom which is, to be honest, competitive or even lower than some of the rentals in that area, which is pretty incredible to see him being able to do that, assuming this all is real and actually comes to fruition and isn't just them buying land to put factories on, put cars on, build headquarters. It's really hard to say because a lot can happen. Him working with the city and stuff like that could you know, turn the town into a small boring company factory area. You know, there's... He can, you can get property changed to different things and have it way different. The real question is, what does having a private entity like someone like Elon owning an actual city mean for a place like that? I mean, how does that all work? If you live in a city that's completely controlled by one guy who for the most part seems like he wants input from other people, which is probably a good thing. How fancy or not fancy, well taken care of would the city look like? How nice are the roads going to be? 
what does starting another business there look like? Like if you're part of that city and you want to build a restaurant, how does all that go down? You still have to go through the actual state or, you know, local municipalities, but also is he going to have a say if, like how does all that work? It'll be fascinating to see how it goes down and what the prices actually really end up being if he's able to do this. And apparently this has been under construction for a few years and they're using small modular homes similar to, I read similar to like the box house he was using at SpaceX, but also I've seen just trailer homes be one of the other ways. So kind of hard to know for sure what's going to be built and done there, but it, it'll be fascinating to see all this happen. And is it possible to have somebody who controls the area really be able to set the prices and I mean, he's not going to do it at a loss. So can you do it sustainably? And can you get a lot of community engagement with something like that? Or is it going to be too many people? Are you creating an echo chamber in real life where it's only people you work with do the same thing, think similarly, like the same thing? It'll be fun. It'll be interesting to see. On that same subject, as we know, Tesla Model Ys were getting their steering wheels yoinked off while being driven, and it turns out that Nissan wants you to do the same thing. So they have recalled about 1,063 of its Aria vehicles, I think that's how those are pronounced, they're electric SUVs, due to steering wheels not being on the steering column anymore. How is this happening? It's a great question. It looks like, from what they've figured out so far, is as these have been shipped in from Japan, they have to undergo some quality control, and it seems like either the bolts holding the steering wheel on have not been tightened all the way, or were just removed and lost. So while they're looking into that and figuring that out for sure, they are going out of their way. They're pausing, they're pausing being able to build these and they're recalling these vehicles too. Now, apparently Nissan found out about this at the end of January, which is actually quite a while ago when you start to think about it. And that was when someone at a dealership who was working on the car noticed it. And then a second dealership reported something similar. And then upon investigation, they were like, oh, the bolt's missing. Which is different, because I believe in Tesla's case, the bolt was there. It just was improperly torqued, which also seems to be something that's happening here. So maybe somebody at the port was like, hey, screw Nissan. They don't pay me well. I don't, I don't know. Just didn't want to put the bolts in. I don't know if that's true, but... It could be one of the things that happened. And this is just important reminder that just because it's brand new does not mean it's ready to be on the road. So have fun with that thought when you're getting your new car. Now, what steps should they be taking? Uh, clearly, they should have multiple people looking at these things from different places and should be inspecting vehicles more closely <laughs> when they get places. If you're shipping them overseas, maybe at the port they get quality controlled and once they get to the dealership, Maybe multiple places it should be looked into. Maybe you shouldn't just try to make as much profit as possible and should care about your customers. Just a thought. Next, we have uh, floating solar panels. This is an interesting technology here because it creates a win-win situation for people where if you have floating solar panels and you put them over water, you can reduce land are being used. You can also increase energy efficiency and you can prevent those that water from evaporating. So if you have like a water reservoir that you know maybe is where the city gets their water, right? Then you put solar panels on top of it. You're now getting power for that city. You're cooling solar panels and you're preventing more of that water from evaporating, especially in warm areas. And it makes the solar panels more efficient in those warm areas. So tons of benefits Maybe some downsides here. So one of the downsides is it's more expensive up front for sure. You also say it is recreational water. Now you have areas that you have to watch out for or not allow people to drive through. You know, it prevents some problems that way. But with that said, some of these are just floating. They make floating solar panels or they're suspended by cables. So there's kind of a couple ways to do it. And if you only use a fraction of the world's reservoirs, with these floating panels, they could generate nearly 10,000 terawatt hours per year. So 
that's a massive amount of power. Just to give you an idea, that's about 940 million homes per year based on the average annual consumption of a home, which is about 10,600 kilowatt hours. And it would prevent about 24 cubic freedom units from evaporating. That's about 100 cubic kilometers for the rest of you. Yeah, but these are significant technology. Solar panels are coming down in cost. It's that's cool. I mean, <laughs> floating solar panels would be a great way to do this, especially in areas where you can, or maybe in motorized boats weren't allowed already. Maybe in areas where you have mining ac excess that just people can't be around, maybe you can put solar panels in there. And that could all be good things for people. It's good for business, good for power, good for water. And especially in areas like that get them from one water source. It's a great way to keep the water there so you have a more sustainable, more filled reservoir, which is a great way to do it. With that said, I think that's it for me today, and I will talk to you guys in the next one. See ya.